name is Leon Stille, and I'm here today with uh, Yusri Mandur. Yusri Mandur is a strategy consultant, and he's also a lecturer of uh, Nairo, the business university. Uh, this, uh, we're going to talk about disruptive change, which I think is a very good subject for uh, the current times that we are in at the moment. So I hope that, uh, that Yusri can uh, shed some light on uh, what we are experiencing and how we can prepare ourselves for this. Uh, before we start, uh, again, you can uh, uh, ask your questions through the chat box uh, of the GoToWebinar platform, and I will see them here on the screen and ask them to Yusri uh, during his talk. And for the students of the Energy Academy, uh, welcome. Uh, this is also one of the, the Energy Academy uh, lectures, so afterwards you will get a questionnaire again. So, like I said now last time, pay attention. Uh, pay attention to Yusri, so we can, uh, we can start with that. Yusri, welcome. Thank, Thank you. you very much, Leon. And I would say, take the floor. Thank you very much. Okay. Well, where else can we start than with Corona, right? Uh -huh. Yeah, absolutely. Uh -huh. Although I think uh, some of you uh, really get fed up with the subject. Um, uh, one of the, the, the things that has been said quite, an, uh, quite, quite a few times in, 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 in various occasions in, in media is that this is a thing that we could not have foreseen. It was like struck by lightning, and uh, and uh, yeah, well, you know, it it it, it took us uh, uh, unguarded. And um, some of uh, some of uh, the people also said, well, it's like a black swan. And uh, the black swan is uh, is uh, a phenomenon that was written by Nassim Taleb. Uh, about 15 years ago, and uh, then he ascribed about events that cannot be foreseen in the economy in society. And uh, the interesting thing is that he said, well, you know, uh, if you think about corona, that's not a black swan. Everyone knew that this was coming. Uh, we didn't know at what time, we didn't know to which extent, but it was already clear that a pandemic like this would mm -hmm. come to our society yeah. uh, uh, <coughs> in the future. A lot of people uh, warned for it already. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. It, was, it was not on. So he said, well, you know, like, uh, like an event like 9-11, that was something that we could not uh, see, uh, that we couldn't prevent. That's a real black swan. But uh, uh, Corona, that's a white swan. And um, Nassim was not the only one who said that. Um, I think quite a few of you already saw the, 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 the TED talk uh, with Bill Gates, where he is exactly explaining what is happening right now. He said, you know, we used to be afraid when, 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 when Bill was a kid of nuclear energy and that uh, maybe we, could, we, we would get a nuclear mm -hmm. war. He said the, the biggest threat of our society is a pandemic. And uh, if you didn't see that, uh, that, that TED talk, please do see it. And it was not only at uh, Bill Gates, there's also a lot of authors like David Quammen, uh, who already b wrote a book mm -hmm. about this, this thing in 2012. So that's eight years ago. So um, um, it's, we cannot say like, okay, it took us on guard that we could not see this, this coming. Mm -hmm. Um, but, but then you also say, sorry to interrupt, yeah. but then you're also saying that, that all these companies should then make contingency plans or something like that. I well, mean, you know, buy, buy a book or because Bill Gates told them so. Yeah, well, you know, if you, um, I, I, I saw the, the, the webinar that you had with Bart yeah. Steyer and he was also talking about uh, scenario analysis, you know, and, and I think uh, this could be an element of your scenario yeah. analysis. So, uh, of course, there is no way to predict uh, when it will come, to which extent. But uh, if so many uh, uh, authors, uh, especially, already talked about that, then, then, well, you know, yeah, you can still you say, take it seriously. You should yeah. take it seriously. Yeah. Um, so if COVID-19 is, is a white swan, um, then you could also think of what is the next event that we already can, can predict that will come we don't know what time, to which extent, but, but we know that this will happen. Um, if you look at this slide, then we see um, uh, after COVID-19, because this thing will go over and we all hope it will be sooner than later. And the next thing is, of course, that we are in a, a tremendous amount of depth throughout the whole world. Look at all the trillions and billions that... that uh, 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 the, the, the national banks now are putting into our economy to, to survive. This is a thing that will go wrong. Yeah. We, can all, we all know that it will happen. 
Um, and it means that we will get a debt crisis after this. It can but take a few years, but it will happen. Interestingly, from the last crisis, that was also a debt crisis. Yes. But instead of reducing the debt, we have increased it. Increased it. And now we increase yeah. it again. Yeah. So that's that's why I'm, um, and this is also not a very positive uh, slide, as you can see. I'm mm -hmm. a bit negative in terms of, um, uh, if you look at... Uh, uh, um, how well do we learn from things that happened to us as mankind in the past? Well, the only thing that we do learn that we don't learn from these events. So we keep on making the same mistakes, yeah. I'm, I, I'm afraid. So, um, and after the economic crisis, what will happen uh, is, of course, if there are so many debts, then um, it will, uh, uh, the, the, the danger is that the whole discussion about sustainability, about climate change, and the investments that we need for that will come under pressure. Yeah. But this climate change will occur. And, and that, that's the next uh, white swan that will come to us. Yeah. So if you know all this, whether you believe it or not, and maybe you have put some other words be, uh, on these white swans or black sharks, as we can <laughs> see here, um, then you can say, okay, what can I do to prevent that? And if I go back to what uh, Taleb was, was uh, saying in another book of him, it's, it's called Anti-Fragile, he says, as a company and also as a society, we have to think about how can we become more anti-fragile. And what I, he means with that, if we get more stress, more change mm -hmm. in society, in our industry, um, how can we benefit from that? Um, because you see, well, you know, um, a lot of companies are already working to become more resilient, becoming more robust. And meaning they can better absorb the shocks mm -hmm. like that is happening right now with, yeah. uh, with uh, COVID-19. But you can also bring it a step further and think, and how can, well, how can we benefit from these events, knowing that they will come? You will and benefit from this kind of white swan event, you mean? Yes, or, exactly. Yeah. Because uh, look at what is happening now <coughs> with a lot of IT or software companies, companies like Microsoft, companies like Zoom. They go skyrocket now because their the relevance of their um, uh, their, their their solutions mm -hmm. has really increased, and uh, I think everyone should think of uh, looking at the business model of their own companies and how can we become more anti-fragile, knowing that these white swans will will occur in the near future. You think that, that Zoom, for example, and, and isn't also not maybe a little bit of luck that they are in well, the correct position at the right time? That's or? a good question, because um, maybe this uh, th this shock is very beneficial for them and the next one isn't. Yeah. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So then the question is, what do we prevent, uh, what do we foresee as events that will occur? Yeah. And how well are we adapted for that? Yeah. And how can we benefit from that? Yeah, again, so scenarios. That's yeah. scenarios. So yeah. You have to think about that, for sure, for sure. So I want to go back with you a little bit uh, in time and think about um, uh, the, the, the rise of new business models, the rise of new industries. And I have an example here uh, that I brought uh, with me uh, to you. And it's, 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 it's an, a bit of an awkward picture. <laughs> And uh, normally uh, in, a, in an audience, I always ask, what do we see here? But yeah, it's a little yeah. bit difficult with, with, with the Just webinar. Just me answering. Yeah, yeah. yeah, <laughs> yeah. And I'll, I'll give you the answer. Um, <clears throat> what we see here is a, a sewing machine. It's a, uh, sorry, uh, it's, uh, sorry, it's a typewriter and it, it's placed on the table of a sewing machine. And then uh, you can see that we could, with the little pedal at uh, the, the, the bottom of uh, the table. And then you might say, well, you know, why would they put this this typewriter on top of this 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 table of a sewing uh, machine? Well, the, and leave the pedal as well. And leave the pedal. That's a, well, very funny for me. <laughs> the correct answer probably is that the company who actually made this typewriter, the, that's the company Remington, also made um, uh, a sewing machines. So probably they had a spare table. I don't know, <laughs> uh, but they were in they were active in both industries. Um, you might also say, well, if you look at the context of using this type of machine, it were the same type of people that were using them. Repetitive uh, um, uh, actions done by, uh, by, by, by at that time, uh, ladies who work very hard mm -hmm. in, in, in processing their jobs. What is interesting about this machine that I would like to share with you is that what we see here is the first, is the Remington number one, that's the first commercial successful typewriter. And it's like nearly one and a half centuries ago. And the funny thing about this machine is that it already had a QWERTY keyboard. Yeah. 
and they figured it out already. Huh? <laughs> yeah, they figured it out. And and then uh, and then it's interesting to think about. So how did they come up with the layout of this machine, and and more particularly the layout of the keyboard? And um, well, um, because. There was no uh, predecessor. This was the first machine. So Remington was the first company who actually had the liberty of putting the letters where they wanted to put them. Yeah. So uh, what they did is that they also had that times they had KPIs. And uh, the first KPIs of this machine is, well, you can, uh, you can, you can uh, uh, think of that yourself, is how can we type as fast as possible with this machine? And if you think about the English idiom, because it was an American company, then, uh, then you should put the letters close to the, the uh, to to your fingers that are uh, used most often in the English idiom. Uh, so that was the first KPI. And then the second KPI is, and maybe you've used this this kind of machine in the past yourself, is that you have these little hammers at the back of the machine, mm -hmm. and they get they get stuck up. You know, they get. Yeah, they, if you type too quickly, yeah, I if think. You type and too they, quickly. they go around. Yeah, yeah. So and then you need to stop typing. So the second KPI is how can we prevent that these hammers get stuck at the back of the machine? And the combination of those two KPIs, that's the birth of QWERTY. Uh, and uh, the interesting thing, thing is, we are now one and a half century later, <laughs> and if you're in, in uh, a, an English-speaking country, uh, and also you're in the Netherlands, we still use this QWERTY keyword. And the funny thing is, um, if you're curious and you want to open up your 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 laptop after this uh, this webinar, I can already uh, 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 explain to you there are no hammers in your machine anymore. <laughs> but still, we are working with QWERTY, yeah. and is that a problem? No, it's not a problem because we're used to it. But it is because if we think about uh, uh, if we would skip out the second KPI, the hammer KPI, then we would be able to come up with a combination of letters where we could type. 10 to 15 percent quicker than we're doing today. Ah, okay. Yeah. So that means that's a, a, a huge productivity gain. But the, the we're just used to it. But we're, we're yeah. not going to change that because yeah. we are so used to it. So that means that apparently we have a stick pattern in our heads that is so strong that we're not willing to abandon that, and we take the 15 percent productivity gain for granted. So, so there was a new industry that 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 occurred at that moment of time and what you see because it was a huge hit this first machine is that other companies also came up with uh, alternatives so we saw other companies that came up with 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 various type of, of typewriters we see here in the in 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 the, in the slide we see uh, the the different uh, examples that they came up with and these were uh, so for instance you see one that really uh, resembles a telephone huh? in the in the left uh, left uh, yeah bottom side um, and this was all you know was well thought of but in the end there was one breakthrough in 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 the industry and the breakthrough we see here in this slide and actually that was uh, the second model of that same company that the Remington and uh, why was this the breakthrough because this machine had such a large appeal towards uh, the, the the actual users of the machines Mm -hmm. that everyone said, this is the machine that I want to have. Yeah. And what was this appeal is that this was the first typewriter where you could actually see what you were typing while you were typing. Ah. All the machines before, you typed a letter, you took the letter out of the machine, you saw that you mistyped somewhere, and you had to start all over again. So oh, I yeah? said, this is great, I want to have that. And then uh, this one also had a shift button, so you were also... Uh, uh, able not only to use the, the the large capitals but also the the, the lowercase capital. So uh, we said this is this is this is this is the machine with a very large attractiveness, uh, a very uh, uh, high uh, Unix spelling point. We yeah. would say, mm -hmm. and this became the dominant design in the industry for decades. All the other machines, whether were the new models of Remington or from um, the the competitors they come up with a similar kind of layout. So this will become the dominant design in the industry. And then you might say, well, why is this guy talking about typewriters? Because this is about energy, right? Well, the reason why I give this example, because I, there is a very interesting phenomenon in the transition um, of business models um, um, uh, in time that I would like to explain to you. And this is based on the research of an MIT professor, James W. Atterbeck, and he found out that in the, uh, in the, the rise uh, uh, and the emergence of 
not only products and services, but also companies and industries, mm -hmm. we see a fixed pattern, yeah. a fixed pattern. And uh, he explained that in what he calls the innovation cycle in time. And let me explain that to you. And I'll start with the breakthrough. The breakthrough was the, the, in the typewriter industry was the Remington number two. I could see what I was typing while I was typing. Mm -hmm. Um, you could also say, other example, more recent, was the first iPhone in the industry. Yeah. Was, hey, now the I first touchscreen, you can see all what you're doing, you have the apps there. Yeah, yeah the apps there in all the programs, that, and there was a combination <coughs> of hardware and software that was so attractive, everyone said, that is the one I, that I want to have. Yeah. So a new industry is born then, and uh, it becomes the dominant design. The next step is that um, Remington started to come up with new models. But the new models, they are very often incremental changes, small changes towards the original dominant design. We see that also with, with the iPhones, you say, you know, okay, it has a bigger screen, it has a- <laughs> More a, cameras. <laughs> more cameras, but, it's in, in, but in essence, it's still the same type of uh, machine. So, and that can last for decades. And we saw that with the typewriter, in the end, they were, uh, uh, well, they were, nearly extinguished by the personal computer, by mm -hmm. IBM, yeah. but that took decades. Eh? And, and we all know in, a, it's, it's in, in 10, 20 years, we're not all looking at our screens like this on, on our uh, uh, all day. We will come up with other solutions, but we don't know what they would look like. Yeah. So that's when we enter the turbulence phase. <coughs> it's very interesting also if you look at, you, you put it into the perspective of energy, for yes. example, if you look at, at the car, you know, a car, we're going to go to electric car, so for internal combustion engine, we go to electric. But the design of the car is based on the fact on the limitations of this internal combustion engine and of the people you want to move. Yeah, exactly. If you're thinking about it completely from the bottom up, you might have a completely different design. Exactly. But we exactly. don't want that because we're used to a car. Yes, yes. <laughs> And 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 the 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 one thing that I would like to share about this 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 uh, dynamics, which is applicable to all industries, um, is that um, um, what happens between the phase of the incremental innovation and the turbulence phase? Because we could say now with COVID nineteen we're in turbulence phase. Mm -hmm. uh, there's no doubt about that. Um, um, but the thing is, how do we get there? What 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 triggers? The, the fact that we leave the path of incremental innovation and we start working on turbulence. And uh, many documents have been written about that and you, you read over and over again three, well, let's call it um, uh, um, reasons why we come to that tipping point. The first one is the rise of a new technology, mm -hmm. which makes sense. Yeah. So, hey, now we have, for instance, you came up with the electrical car, yeah. now we have the capacity of the, the battery, for instance, which is improved in such a way that we are now able to come up with yeah, a- It's usable. It's yeah. usable now. Yeah. Yeah. So that was that is new. We didn't have that solution yesterday. So that's, that makes it possible to come up with this kind of new solution. The second one is that we see a shift of um, uh, uh, behavior in terms of what companies and consumer desire from their suppliers. Example there. Um, I think if you look at um, uh, at now, uh, very, what happens a lot right now is that if we order a package mm -hmm. uh, from uh, from uh, like a post order, we uh, we expect that it will be delivered the next the next day or even the same day. So mm -hmm. that is something where we change our behavior. We feel like okay, but there are other desires and needs mm -hmm. uh, that have. Uh, that have shifted over time. I predict that the COVID-19 will, uh, what will happen with the COVID-19 is that we will shift behavior in terms of that, that we are looking for other kinds of references, for other kinds of uh, desires and needs. This will give a huge uh, boost to the digitization. Yeah, uh, of, you already of see it. You had, to, you had to use it, but now yeah. people feel it's also very, very yeah. nice actually. So it's a change of behavior yeah. from a consumer perspective. And the final one is that, and that's also I think very applicable also in the energy industry, is that when um, uh, uh, the government um, comes up with new rules and regu uh, or regulations, when they are blocking an existing solution or they opening up a new market. Mm -hmm. So those are the three reasons why we step from incremental innovation towards the turbulence phase. Yeah. And what's interesting to, 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 to say there, we all know that it will happen, but we never know when. Yeah. We never know when. 
And this is why, where a lot of discussion go uh, in companies about, okay, do we all believe that this will happen in a short period of time or do we have still some, some, some time to wait? Yeah. That, that is, that's a big discussion. Is it also that with older companies or at least like if I have yeah. the feeling now that, for example, innovation goes quickly. So yeah. we have lots of information to our available so we can come up with new ideas. But if you look at Remington, that's already 150 years old. Yeah. Is it in general true that companies 100 years ago were less innovative than they are now? Well, I don't know. I t that's that's, ha that's, that's hard to say. Yeah. What, what you could say, if you look at this innovation cycle, um, and that's the reason why I came up with such an ancient example, uh, if people start talking about new business models, that's nothing new, guys. That's nothing new. It's always has been there. Yeah? The, that, that's what, what, what we see here in this graph. But the only thing that is different is that we the, the, the circle... Is, is moving much more rapidly than yeah. it has been this doing in the past. Yeah. Because of the digitization of the whole society, information that, that, that is so transparent and, and, and flows so quickly, mm -hmm. then uh, uh, you see that we, can, we have a shorter time that we can benefit from a dominant, dominant design. Yep. Okay, so um, <coughs> let me go quickly towards the, the next slide. So if you know that, and, and uh, you are aware of the fact that either we're going to this turbulence phase or we, we are, we are well, well, uh, uh, already uh, in there. Um, then you say, okay, what, do, what, what can I do about that within my company? And that's where this slide I think is very interesting is that first there should be a common ground or call it a sense of urgency within the company that we do need to change things in our current behavior. And uh, that's the only good thing about the terrible disease of the COVID-19 is that this discussion is much shorter yeah. right now. Yeah. The, it's almost existential. Yes, yeah. because the, 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 the company is on fire, the, the, the society is on fire, so we do know that we have to, to, to change things. The second step is if we know that we are heading towards a dead-end street, then we are going to shift lanes. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the, the difficult part there is that we have to do two things simultaneously. We need to modernize our existing solution on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. we, we always have to do that. Yeah. That's what I call... Competitiveness. Yeah. 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 We have to rebuild. We have to outsmart our competitors. Uh, we need to become more leaner, more efficient. That's, that's nothing new. But it's not good enough. It's not good enough. We need also to think about if we know that these white swans are coming... How can we reinvent ourselves? How can we come up with a solution that fits this new market situation? Yeah. And very often, that is something that is not in line with the rebuilding part of the company. Yeah. And that's why the tension starts. Yeah, because that's also, uh, some of these companies, I mentioned, I was trying to figure out, okay, are they less innovative than yeah. they used to be? But some companies are very big, so it's difficult to... To yeah. innovate, it's difficult to get, for example, middle management on board if you have a great idea and they don't want to listen. Yeah. So what do you do then? Well, How do you, you know, what, get what, these hurdles over? Yes, what I see very often that it's the higher management who are the ambassadors of the reinvent that's in creating new business model within the, 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 the company because they have a broad overview of what is happening in the company and in the markets where they're active in. And, and at the same time, um, they don't feel like uh, the, 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 the rush of the shareholders that the board is feeling very often. Yeah, so yeah. they're the ones who are very often the ambassadors of these chains. So I always say, see if you can find your support there in, yeah. the, in the higher management well, layers. Although it can be difficult, of course. Yeah, they're of course. not always approachable. You know, if of a very large company, it's hard, I think, to get there. Definitely, yeah. definitely true. Yeah. So reinvent, eh, because that sounds very, very easy. Uh, so what, what does that mean? That means you have to rethink your current strategy of your company, thinking about everything that's happening now and the white swans that are approaching us. Are we still on the right track or do we have to change course? The next conclusion very often is that, well, we have to abandon our existing organizational model because very often it's not suited for this new reality. We have to think about rebooting the organization, meaning starting from a white canvas, see if we can come up with a new solution. And that's hard because people say, yeah, but we don't have a blank canvas. We already have a company and it needs to continue. 
That's right. So yeah. you have to reorganize yourself to create room to, uh, in order to reboot or to set up a new initiative. And then finally, that means then we have to reset the course. And, and this sounds very easy, yeah. <laughs> but to be honest, it's only, especially if you're looking at large corporations, it's only a couple of uh, large corporations that are actually successful in this. And I brought you an example. Yeah. Before uh, we go to the example, yeah, yeah. large oil companies, so large oil and gas majors, for example, do they, are they even able to do this? I mean, you, you talk about this, yeah. in, in, of course, in theory, and it needs to happen. Yeah. But uh, I also feel that, for example, a company that is already very old, like Shell, has, yeah. a, has a lot of turbulent faces, so they manage to reinvent themselves to a certain extent already. But are they able to do this? Can they do it fast enough? Well, I think that's the one million dollar question. <laughs> huh? And, and, and if, you, if, if you look at uh, the, mm. the, the innovation cycle, it also means that, well, there is a certain lifespan of companies. Yeah. And it might, and, and it might, uh, the, the conclusion could be that if you don't are able to reinvent yourself, that means that your relevance will go down and in the end mm -hmm. you don't exist anymore. No. So uh, that means that if you're looking at, at, at the, the rise and fall of industries, if, if your industry is going down, you need to retransform yourself towards a new solution, a new kind of uh, offering that you where, where you can increase your relevance. Uh, are all companies able to make that turn? No. Mm -hmm. For yeah. sure they're not. No. Uh, but, but is that a bad thing? That's the question. No, this, it's, yeah. it's, it's not a bad thing. But if you are working in one of those companies, yeah, of it can be very frustrating, of yeah. course. Yeah. Especially when you are seeing what's happening and you cannot mm. convince your colleagues to, 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 to go along. So, but give, going back yeah. to, to, the, to the, the example of the White Raven, I brought an example of a company who was able to, to make that turn. And it's an example that many people are not aware of um, because it's the company Netflix. And we all know Netflix is also anti-fragile at this moment of time. Eh? They, 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 they're increasing their business a lot. And then you say, well, you know, but this is not an existing company. Um, I mean, this is the newcomer in time, right? Well, actually, many people don't know that uh, Netflix already uh, exists in the market for about 20 years. And uh, Netflix, what they used to do um, about 20 years ago is that you could have a subscription to Netflix and then you, go, you would get a uh, videotape and later on a DVD sent to your doorstep <laughs> and then you could see a film. That was their main business. And as, as you can see in the slide, that was a, a, a very profitable business. And uh, that was growing with double-digit growth each year. And in the year 2007, something interesting happened. Um, because there was a very famous board meeting in 2007, mm -hmm. where uh, Reed Hastings, the CEO and founder of, of, of Netflix, he looked back to the last year, the previous year, and also uh, was talking to the troops towards the next year. And then um, there was a very positive atmosphere because, again, double digit growth, all the budgets were surpassed, so everyone was happy with that. And there was also the first time there was a, uh, a project team, which was called Instant Watch. Mm -hmm. The word streaming didn't <laughs> exist at that moment of time. Who were able to get some, some profit or some, some, some turnover, I mean, out of their business for the first time. Yeah. And, um, and, and the people in the company, you know, they, they laughed a little bit about that. And finally, they were able to get some... some, <laughs> uh, some Poor some guys, they found some money. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, so, um, Reed Hastings, he, 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 at that meeting, he spoke to his troops and he said, you know, guys, we had a tremendous year. And the reason why this company is so successful, that is, uh, we, we need to fully thank the, the people that are responsible for the DVD shipments. So, it's an American company. We, I would like to have a warm applause of everyone here for the, uh, the directors of the DVD shipments. Yeah. So, everyone stood up and they started applauding. And then when the applauding stopped, he said, and uh, by the way, DVD shipment is not going to be the future of our company. And these people, the di directors, are also not part of that future. That's also very American. Mm -hmm. huh? So, uh, and the reason for that, he said, because we need to shift our company towards the instant watch kind of solution, because this is the white swan where we're going there. And I know that many of you here in the audience believe that this is not going to work because we have technical issues with bandwidth. Um, people are not willing to pay for subscription on the internet. So there are a lot of hurdles. 
but there is no turning back. This is the thing that we need to invest in. Mm -hmm. And this is, of course, now this is history and we all know what happened afterwards. <laughs> uh, they grew tremendously with the, with the streaming. Why is this such an important example? Why uh, I would like to emphasize this is because Reed Hastings in 2007 showed the right leadership that was needed to make the shift within the company. Mm -hmm. And I think coming back to your <coughs> question about are oil companies, for instance, able to make that shift, uh, this is very much to do with the leadership within the company. Yeah. And that's not only, uh, and then I'm not talking about greenwashing, but a profound feeling that there is no turning back. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't mean that we can shift our current business overnight towards 100% sustainable, but this is the path that we need to yeah. follow. Similar to Netflix, yeah, because they also didn't shift their business completely right away, but they did focus on the new thing as well. And the good thing is that they had funding from the DVD shipment business yeah. to invest in their streaming business. But that's in essence with all the all the oil majors similar. Exactly. Because they have the funding, at least they had it yeah. until the oil crash, of course, but they have it available to to do have that shift to do until shift. you wait too long yeah until you wait too long yeah and the other thing is what happens in most companies is that they would have waited until well let's say 2009 2010 to really start investing in the streaming business mm -hmm. and what happens then is that you get a disruptor in your market who sees the opportunity and fills the gap yeah and they close the door in in an early phase yeah interesting mm. so I mentioned the word business model a couple of times, and um, um, what I would like to share with you, a, a very simple model that I use in one of the books that I wrote, um, uh, it's called, I call it the business model wheel. And I say a business model exists of four perspectives. First of all, you have to think about what are the customer segments that we are ser uh, servicing. And so wh what are our targets group? And what of kind of a relationship do we want to, to achieve with them? The second perspective is what I call the offering perspective. So what, is the, what are the services and products that we actually offer towards the target group? And, and what kind of channels do we use in order to distribute these goods and services and how we communicate with these customers? If you think of the top two parts of this wheel, many people say, well, you know, we changed our business model. And in fact, they didn't because <laughs> what they did is that they come up with a new solution for an existing or a new target group. I call that a new product market combination. That's already written in marketing books in 1960, you know, <laughs> and that's not a bad thing, but it's not a new business model. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's a new portfolio of what you're already doing. It's a bit incremental. Yeah. It's incremental. Yeah. It's incremental. But very often within the company, they say incremental, please get out of the building. Huh? Yeah. This is huge what we're doing. But in a way, it's still the same old business model. We, when do we see that a new business model arises when we take into account the, the lower end of the, of, of the wheel? That means we are going to shift the way that we make money. That's the, the way that we charge our customers for our products and the services. Yeah. So where we used to charge them, for instance, for the amount that they bought with us, now we say no. You 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 can you can take as many as much as you like, and you pay a fixed amount of money each month, for yeah. instance. So you're changing the way that you are uh, uh, creating your income and cost structure. And finally, the 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 fourth perspective. So that was the financial perspective, and the fourth perspective is the organizational model. So how are we are, are how are we organized? What are the things, the activities that we are very good at? What are the, 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 the core competences within our company? And what are, what are activities that we say, well, you know, we can also outsource them towards other network mm -hmm. uh, uh, companies, uh, uh, relations of us who are uh, uh, doing a better job there. And um, we all understand, I, uh, well, I hope you all understand these four perspectives. The problem is, that this sounds very simple, but why is it so hard to come up with a very good new business model? Because you have to look at this as a whole wheel. Mm -hmm. So that means there should be a logic between the different perspectives. And if there's no logic, so you don't have like a, uh, well, uh, uh, let's call it a holistic view on where you want to go there, what, what companies you, you want to, to service, what is the new solution, 
how is uh, how how what what are the implications in terms of finance and organization? If you don't do that, then you don't have a balanced business model. Yeah, and that makes it hard. Huh? And <clears throat> um, uh, and and then the second reason why is it so hard to come up with a uh, a, a successful new business model is that this is very much thought of inside out. Yeah. Uh, in terms of, we feel that we need to uh, we need to come up with a solution for that target group, um, and this is the way that we are going to charge them. But you have to think first of what is happening in my industry, what is happening in society, and um, uh, in the talk, uh, the webinar with Bert Stuy, mm -hmm. he came up with the three D model, which yeah. I like very much. Yeah. <clears throat> so, well, you know, if you're looking at the uh, the the energy industry. It's, it's about decarbonization, decar it's about um, uh, digitizing and decentralization. Yep. Well, here in this slide, I came up with a couple of other um, uh, um, uh, trends that are happening throughout various industries nowadays. And um, I think the first thing that you need to do if you want to uh, design a new business model is to think, what is happening out there? Mm -hmm. And, um, of course, the first thing that you think of is right now the COVID, of course, yeah. but also think a step further in terms of, okay, what are the implications of that? And what is already happening on a smaller scale, but we will see that it will grow. Yeah. Because a successful business model needs to have a perfect fit with the things that are happening within your industry and in, so in, in society. And, and if you don't do that exercise then the chances that it will be successful are quite minimal, yeah. to be honest. And I think that, for example, sustainability, that's a, that's an aspect, of course, energy companies are struggling, at least existing energy companies are struggling with. So what you already mentioned, the room is being made by, for example, uh, society or, or yeah. politicians that say, okay, this dot on the horizon is full decarbonization by 2050. You guys make it happen. And then these, these companies have to adapt it, and the sustainability comes into that. How do these companies fit in sustainability, you think, in their business models? Well, you know, that's, that, that's an interesting question because um, um, everyone is full of sustainability, and of course, especially in the, in the energy industry. Mm -hmm. um, the reality, my reality, is for quite a few companies that I've worked for in the last couple of years, there's no way, of course, sustainability is, is, is a hot topic. Yeah. But when the push comes to shove, I also see that um, there are other aspects of the business that sometimes are more urgent. And then say, yes, we need to do that. But then it's- Later. <laughs> and then they say, well, you know, we'll, 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 uh, we'll cross that bridge when we get there, especially when the, the term of 2050 is so far away. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I think this is a bit different in the energy industry. Eh? That, that, that's for sure. Um, but But, it's an interesting question because I, I do believe if you really feel like sustainability that needs to be in the core of our business model, um, then it also must be felt in the hearts and the minds of the people that are mm -hmm. working there. Yeah. And else it's, it's, it's no use. Yeah. Then you just do that, well, like a side dish, you yeah, know, yeah. and it's not going to work. But can it help if you sort of figure out what can be a business model from the sustainability? Yeah. You can present that to the board, to yeah. the middle management and say, okay, guys, yeah. same That's with the instant watch. Yeah. Yes, and I think, I think uh, d d d coming back to the white swans, it's like, you know, the sustainability, that's, that's here to stay. It's mm -hmm. not going to change. Yes, probably we'll get a debt crisis and it will also put pressure on... Uh, the funding uh, uh, for sustainability, I'm afraid, um, but it will come back again because yeah. uh, it's a long-term uh, process. It's a yeah. long-term process, and, and 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 that's a tricky part because it's long-term. Is there also a a sense of urgency right now? Yeah. And I, I uh, and, and I've learned over the years if if you cannot find the ambassadors for this uh, uh, um, uh, change, uh, this change or this this uh, sense of urgency then it's very hard to roll it out yeah. throughout the company. That's the reality. How about large companies with, with, with shareholder shareholder perspectives? Yeah. Are they able to do this? Can they do this? Is you it know, a drag in your experience? No, well, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting to see is that you get more societal uh, uh, impact from society in terms of, we, guys, this is something that we cannot neglect anymore. Mm -hmm. So that could put a right pressure on the board of companies. Yeah. yeah. yeah? Um, uh, but you can also say, well, you know, um, but in the end of the day, we need to make profit. Mm -hmm. So um, 
So that, it depends on your shareholders, actually. Exactly. Because shareholders and society are not necessarily the same. No, exactly, yeah. exactly. So for me, there, there's no doubt about that this sustainability is here to stay. Mm -hmm. And that for sure, a lot of the successful upcoming business models, they adapt or they embrace sustainability. Yeah. Um, and they uh, manage to convey that also to the shareholders. Saying, exactly. okay, this is not the way forward. Yes, we need profits, but we can still do this. Yeah. We have to do this. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but, 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 but the, and that's interesting to see the difference with the COVID. The COVID-19 is so in our face, we cannot neglect that. Mm -hmm. uh, we cannot say, well, you know, we wait until tomorrow. Yeah. Whereas with sustainability, uh, you yeah. have more room so to long, maneuver. Uh, yeah. uh, so that, the, so that, that, that's the hard part. Okay. Mm -hmm. let's, let's talk a little bit more about an, an, a, a short example of an, 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 a couple of flights I got from uh, Alma de Boer from Eneco of a company, a Dutch energy company, um, who actually uh, was one of well, may, maybe the first major energy company in the Netherlands who embraced the sustainability. Mm -hmm. uh, and, 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 and now it's there in your face, it's in their mission, uh, everyone's sustainable energy. And of course, I know a lot of energy companies are embracing that right now uh, uh, to various extent, yeah. but they were the first one here in the Netherlands who really uh, were a strong believer in that. If I go back to the wheel, we can find some interesting uh, elements there. For instance, let's see how they are organized. And I just pick out a few things and I'm, I don't have the intention here to lay out the whole uh, en uh, Eneco uh, company, <laughs> but just some initiatives that I think are interesting to see where they are making steps towards that new business model. Yeah. Because that's also something, it takes time to get there. Eh? Um, many of these classic examples, eh, we all know the Nokia examples, all this, this transformation, they, they, they last for very often a decade or even longer than a decade uh, in order to really transfer the company towards the, the new position. Yeah. Um, so what, what, what do you see in, in the way that, that Aneco is organized? They, they, they are developing and operating these sustainable energy assets and, and they do that commission by or in cooperation with customers. So um, that's interesting to see there because I'm a strong believer of, of doing of organizing uh, especially your innovation and, and, and your activities throughout a network. Um, example that you can give there um, is if you go uh, with the Dutch railways, they operate already a couple of years 100% uh, carbon neutral. Mm -hmm. And they were the ones, uh, and together with them, uh, with the, the network park at uh, uh, Dutch railways, they were able to, to achieve this. Other example is what they say is that, and I like that very much, is that within Eneco there is an open mind in terms of, we have a lot of uh, very smart um, uh, engineers within the companies, but we also are aware of the fact that there are even more smart people outside of our company. Yeah. So that we need to, to build bridges in order to create a network so that we can become stronger. Mm -hmm. And this makes sense to a lot of people, but the old thinking in many companies is still, you know, we need to protect yeah. uh, our, our patents. We need to make sure that no one, no one knows what we're doing and, uh, and we need to invest in that development ourselves. Yeah. That's the completely other that, approach. That's probably the competitive advantage that people think of traditionally. Like, okay, this way I guard my competitive exactly. advantage. I'm not going to say tell you how to do it, but still. Yeah. yeah. Another one yeah. uh, element that I like about what they're doing is that they say, well, we you know, innovation is on the edge of the organization. And that's what I very often see. As like I said, this reinvent part, that means that you come up with teams that organize themselves uh, throughout various projects in order to come up with new v value propositions. And very often that's it's on the outskirts of your existing business. Yeah. So there is some, some overlap, but it's relatively small, especially in the beginning of our. And that also means that when that becomes successful and it starts growing, and mm -hmm. I'll give you an example of that in a minute, uh, that means then the, the, the good thing is to do it, get people out of the core of the company and let them collaborate with them. So that you get a crossover of yeah. that of, of that 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 uh, well uh, uh, the innovation within the company. So they organize themselves in a very clever way, in my point of view. If you look then towards the 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 the, the client segments that uh, that uh, they service to, um, one element I would to pinpoint there is what I call um, they're embracing power and also of course energy. Mm -hmm. 
to the people, meaning um, looking to all the initiatives that they are working with together or they are investing in, uh, those are initiatives, uh, many of these initiatives are um, uh, groups of people or small organization who are creating energy themselves. Yeah, cooperatives. Cooperatives. Yeah. And uh, of course, uh, a, a <clears throat> lot of energy companies are doing that uh, right now, but they were quite fast in embracing that. Why is that so interesting to see in my point of view? Because uh, um, the, the intuitive reaction of the uh, large corporation is to say, well, you know, but this is a hazard to our business because yeah. that's our business uh, to create the energy. So let's keep these guys out of the door as long as possible. Mm -hmm. Whereas an eco said, well, you know, this is a wave that we cannot stop. Yeah. So why don't we make a part of that? In uh, uh, because uh, it's better to 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 be part of this movement uh, than to try to stop it and lose our business at all. So that's why I said they are embracing. The, one of the uh, trends where the, the, the power is moving towards uh, the consumer who is also the prosumer. Yeah. Is digitization not a key aspect that makes this possible of for course. an eco? I mean, this, otherwise, if you look at it 30 years ago, it was almost impossible probably to do yeah. this. Yeah. yeah. That, and that's, 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 that's a very re good remark that you made. There. Because if we then go to what do they actually offer, yeah. you see a shift there yeah, where it used to be fully focused on energy you see that they are uh, shifting their, their profile, but also to extent where you say, well, how can we move up towards electricity, digitization, because then we enter new markets. Mm -hmm. And very often it's the combination of existing industries and parts of adjacent industries where new business models yeah. occur, where they arise. Yeah. And that's what they are doing. And so they say, okay, let's look at it at a broader perspective than only the traditional energy perspective and make life easier for our business uh, uh, clients and our consumer clients. And a very uh, well-known uh, example here in the Netherlands is that they come up with an innovation where they say, well, let's replace the traditional thermostat in the, in the housings. And um, if we uh, if we are able to, uh, to 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 come up with this kind of a solution, that also means that we can connect a lot of data, yeah. <laughs> uh, where we come up with new innovation that are related with not only energy, but we enter to the field of the whole smart home uh, um, uh, 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 movement, mm -hmm. where we are a crucial element in all kinds of digitization and electricity within a household, which is a very I interesting place to, 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 to take. And, and this is more or less, this could be, for instance, if, you, if they're doing a good job there and they're still growing in this aspect, is that you say, this, is, this might be the shift from the DVD shipments yeah. towards um, uh, the streaming business, where they say, well, you know, we see that the energy industry um, is, is getting uh, more difficult. We see the cooperative. So, you know, what is our future there? Of course, there is future, but it will be different. Mm -hmm. And how can we create new value uh, in, in a new position that is adjacent, adjacent to our uh, yeah. current business? I think it's an interesting question that has also popped up, and I can answer it a little bit together yeah. with you, is that this sort of, an eco is an older company, but still you can say, okay, they're changing into a new business model and new company almost. Yes. So they challenge in that sense the, 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 the status quo. Yes. And they can do that because then they will also change the institutions around them. Exactly. Because this enables people to uh, get all the information that is required to make sure that, for example, the intermittency of renewables can be tackled to a yes. certain extent just by being smart. Yeah. And, and, the, and the key element there, in my point of view, is to, uh, to break the status quo, is to, to open free yourself from the traditional pattern. Yeah. Free yourself from the QWERTY keyboard. Yeah. keyboard eh, where like you say, why do you need this? Yeah. Eh, that you say, well, you know, we, 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 have to make, we have to make these bridges with these other companies. We have to embrace the clients and their needs and make their lives easier. And then we need to open up ourselves um, and think out of the box in order to come up with solutions that actually will help them. Yeah. And then finally, to make the, 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 the wheel round again, is that you say, well, you know, um, it also means that if we come up with these new kinds of solutions, 
that our clients need to benefit themselves from, from it. If they don't benefit from them, they, they will not embrace it. Um, uh, again, the parallel to the COVID-19 uh, situation right now. Many people say, you know, this will change society and we will not go back to the old society. I'm not so <laughs> sure of that. Yeah. I'm not so sure of that. What I do believe is that the things that we are uh, experiencing right now in this uh, uh, changing society, for instance, uh, how we use digitization in terms of uh, skipping meeting, but, uh, but yeah, using... Not physically be present. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. If we see the benefits of that... Then we do it. Yeah. It will stay. Yeah. If we don't see the benefit of that, then we'll go back to our own pattern. Mm -hmm. I'm sure of that. Yeah. When we find a vaccine or whatever, when this thing is over. So um, that is very good to think of if you if you say, okay, we see a change relationship between us as an energy supplier and our clients, what is the benefit for them? Mm -hmm. If there's no benefit for them, then it's very uh, likable that your business model will not fly. Is, huh? it, is it also related to that if you take it one step higher, now these billions and trillions of euros are floating around the world, people trying to, uh, sort of, governments trying to maintain the status quo, mm -hmm. so to say. But you were saying, okay, but the status quo in that sense has to be challenged or it needs normal, yeah. in normal ways it is challenged. Do we need to do this or do we have to uh, invest that money smarter? Like, do we need to put it, for example, yeah. shares in companies that, that are helping within the sustainability or that are helping within the public uh, sphere? Yeah, well, you know... Um, Certain companies, they have to I, I, fail. I, I, I do believe that the, the, the government um, has a role of a Kickstarter of uh, trends that are beneficial for society. Mm -hmm. um, at that having said, um, it should be a Kickstarter and then... Over let time, yeah. let it go. Yeah. Because I am a strong believer that the market should pick it up mm -hmm. in the end. And of course, there are a lot of difficult uh, uh, discussions about leveling playing field. Yeah. You know, it should be throughout the whole of Europe. Um, so, so those are the challenges, of course. But I do believe as a Kickstarter, they, they, they can take that role. But some, some conditions, for example, because yeah. now are there some conditions attached to this free money? That, that is logical, right? That yes. You can say, okay, great guys, you can keep going, but we expect you to be more... Green, yes, it's faster. Yeah. Yes, uh, yeah. and 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 uh, and I, I I do think it's necessary. Yeah. I do think it's necessary. Okay. Yeah. Uh, last example from an eco, and again, this is not trying to put the whole business model of an eco, but just some of the initiatives that really took my attention, and and shows the the way that they're heading uh, for. Uh, was finally is that um, you see a lot of their. Their, their income models are related to services kind of uh, solutions, like energy as a server. So, and they have, for instance, a, a company, Luminex, who comes up with smart public lighting. Again, where you see they decrease the amount of energy that's being used, which is also beneficial yeah, for, for society. For society. Yeah. And where you see, okay, both parties, they, 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 they benefit. Them. Yeah. yeah. So do they lose their sorry? Do they yeah. lose their identity in that sense? I mean, is it a bad thing or not? Because no. there's a question like, how do you maintain your identity when you're going through this new value creation well, that, business model? Well, you know that, that that's. I think yes, you do also need to transfer towards a new identity. Uh, you 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 need to change the 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 well, call it the purpose, call it the, the mission and vision of the company, mm -hmm. and it also means that your identity will will yeah. shift over time. Yeah. And, and of course, the, 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 the key question is there, but how do we remain the things that we're really good at? Yeah. yeah? And, and, and I have a small example at the end of this uh, okay. lecture right yeah. now. We have five minutes yeah, yeah. <laughs> where I want to challenge you guys, uh, because like I said quite a few times in, the, in this webinar, one of the main challenges very often is that we need to get rid of our fixed way of thinking. Uh, we, we, we are yeah. stuck in our mind. And... Uh, I would like to end the uh, webinar with a small example where that can help you to design a new business model to get you rid of your existing thinking. And the way that I do that is I'm going to ask you, or you can do this with your colleagues, to do this exercise. And it starts with, I'm going to ask you an intentional, unreasonable statement. What I mean with that, I'm going to really ask something nasty of you guys. And I want you to think about that. And it's unreasonable. I know it's unreasonable, but it's the only way that it works. So, prepare yourself. 
Yeah, so there is a wave coming. We already see it on the slide. Think of your own company. Think of your bi current business model. How would it change if from tomorrow on, and here's the first unreasonable statement, from tomorrow on, your focus lies 100% of non-customers only, meaning we don't care about the existing customers anymore. We just leave them in the corner and all of our operations are focusing on to reach and to grab those customers that we are currently not reaching, that are out of reach for whatever reason. So we are building a new business model where we reach only the non-customers. Second unreasonable statement. From tomorrow on, we get rid of all the services and products that we have in our Cadillac. We only have one product on the shelf. It's, it's, we're going to become a one-trick pony. How does that look like? What, what trick? <laughs> what trick do, do we choose for? Yeah. Eh? And what do we leave out? And what does this mean for mm. all the four perspectives of the business model wheel? Third one. Third uh, unreasonable statement. What about if your customer, uh, you know, you can send that invoice to your customer, but he's not going to pay it anymore. Eh? And uh, this sounds ridiculously, but in this COVID-19 uh, period, this is yes. something that is already happening. It's a reality, yeah. This is the reality. Yeah. So that means you cannot get away anymore with your existing type of offering. Your customer is not going to pay for that. So it means either you need to find another source of income or you need to alter your, your services in such a way that your current customer is willing to pay that new kind of uh, bill that you send them. Yeah. And the final one is from tomorrow on, you stop with 75%, uh, three quarters of the activities that you conduct nowadays. You don't outsource them, that would be too easy. No, you just entirely stop with these activities. So what, what, what 25% of activities do you remain? You say, but that we don't want to get rid of that because that is so crucial, that is so special what we're doing there, and that's the only thing that you're going to do. So for ridiculously, I know, eh, um, uh, statements, but this will help you to get rid of your fixed patterns and create new business models. And of course, most of the things that come out of here are not, you are not able to come up with. But I always say, if you create new business model, start by thinking big, because your colleagues, <clears throat> they will make it small for you. They do that for free. <laughs> uh, they, they say, you know, this is a bit too wild. So yeah, we'll make all it. kinds of uh, so please barriers they come up with. Yeah. Start big, and then when you start with the implementation, execution, start small. Oh. Uh, then you say, start with a pilot. And that's what I wanted to share with you. Um, that's also what I wrote in, uh, sorry, it's only a Dutch book. This is how you renew your business model. These are 12 strategic routes that help you to get out, your, out of your fixed pattern and to create a new business model. And that is the final thing that I would like to say is um, think about when you're restructuring, how can we become more anti-fragile? Yeah. How mm -hmm. do, what are the white swans that we see appearing in the horizon? And what is our solution to that? Great. Thank you very much, Yussi. Okay. I think it's a great uh, speech. Uh, you highlight a lot of these the things that are going on at the moment. It's very relevant even. It's quicker than ever. Thanks. And uh, it's good that you sort of yeah, be advocate a little bit, like be open for criticism, be open to think outside the box to people that have yeah. ridiculous ideas. Perhaps it's the new, the new normal. Exactly. Who knows? A couple of months ago, nobody would have said that we would do these webinars only online and nobody yes. would... Uh, good example. So it's already a good example. So thank you very much. If you want to know more about Yushi, you can find him on LinkedIn as well, but he's also part of some of our programs. Uh, next week, there's no webinar for uh, the, the because it's a holiday. But 14 of May, we have the hydrogen webinar again. Um, and this also, at this moment, I would like to use this moment that we are launching the first real online course as well, also on the hydrogen value chain. So if you want to know more about the hydrogen value chain, you're welcome to register in the course. It's on our website, Energy Delta. Thank you very much, and uh, we'll uh, have a good day. Thank you. Thank you.